invite Dr. Faisal to first give us his input uh, on the larger picture of Sarawak and the issues of uh, uh, good governance uh, there. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, a very good uh, afternoon to everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank um, C4 and also Medica Center for the invitation. I was initially asked to talk about the issue of governance in Sarawak as a backdrop to today's presentation. But somehow along the way, uh, a few days ago, uh, I was told by Ben that I supposed to talk about Sarawak elections, which is more interesting than um, issues of corruption in Sarawak. So, so here I am. Um, that would be the focus of my presentation today. Um, I'm going to look more into the key electoral dynamics that uh, I believe would eventually uh, uh, affect the final outcome of the looming Sarawak state elections. And I try to link up with uh, the study done by C4 and also Medeca Center. Uh, but, yeah. But before, before I go any further, let me give you some backdrops to, to the elections, uh, to the non Sarawakian audience especially. Now, if, if we start with the seats breakdown um, uh, in, in Sarawak, in terms of uh, ethnicity, uh, Sarawak has about 37% Malay, Melanau majority seats. So that amounted to about 26 seats. Interestingly, uh, the Malays and the Melanau constitute only about uh, Malays, the third largest ethnic groups, whereas Melanau, the fifth largest ethnic groups, respectively. Uh, but then again, they form the biggest uh, representations in uh, Dewan Undangan Negeri Sarawak. And this followed by uh, Iban, with about 28% uh, seats, Chinese 13, sorry, Chinese 18, Bidayu 8, Orang Ulu 6, and mix seats, about 3% of the seats. And then in terms of, uh, this is another interesting feature of Sarawak elections, uh, that it, is, it has this rural character, that if you look at the uh, data here, about more than two-thirds of the seats are basically rural seats. That is about 76% of uh, 71 seats uh, in Sarawak. Again, this is not including the um, proposed introduction of 11 new seats, which would uh, uh, amount to about 82 seats. Uh. So this is as it is, about 71 seats. And about 24 seats are basically urban seats. And this is, uh, I think, another interesting point that I want to highlight to you. Uh, based on the 2013 uh, election results. Um, interestingly, the number of marginal seats in Sarawak had increased significantly. In 2011, the number of marginal seats uh, was about nine seats, and seven of that is basically BN marginal seats. And, and this figure increased significantly to about 16 in 2013. And 12 of that uh, seats are basically BN uh, marginal seats. And, and if you look at the uh, table here, majority of these marginal seats are basically Iban and also Chinese seats. And if you notice, none of the Malay, Melanau majority seats is considered marginal. Uh, these are the backbone, basically, of uh, Barisan national dominance in Sarawak. Um, and, and another interesting point, uh, based on the 2013 uh, elections, because um, 2011 was quite far away, uh, and, and with the help of uh, Medeca Center as well, we were able to analyze the 2013 uh, election uh, data and uh, you know, chunk it into uh, the state constituencies. And based on this data, interestingly, um, the momentum of change that Pakatan Rakyat had brought in the last two elections, 2006, 2011, actually somehow subsided in the 2013 elections. The loss 
two seats. In fact, actually, they lost three seats that they won in 2011. They lost Baklalan, they lost Dudung, and also Maradung. PKR Sarawak Chief Barubian, eh? Baklalan, lost. Basically, if you look at the parliamentary results, but you look at uh, the results in Baklalan, basically, PKR lost that, that seat. But they managed to capture Telangusan. This is where the proposed Baram Dam is, is going to be built. And this is one of the major factors why they lost, Barisan National lost uh, Telangusan. Um, and, and as a result, Barisan National managed to increase its seat tally from 55 into 011 to 58 into 013. Uh, this is another interesting um, uh, trend uh, based on the 2013 uh, election uh, results. Um, Barisan national support increased across the board, including among the Chinese. This is basically, I mean, uh, I didn't actually look at uh, uh, the result based on polling streams. I mean, if you look at based on polling streams, uh, it will produce a different uh, uh, results. But this is basically looking at the majority seats. Uh, so if you look at Barisan national support to 011, to 013, it increased across the board, including among the Chinese. And the most interesting thing is how strong the Bumi Putra support is, especially among the Malay Mlana, 81.4% towards Barisan national. And also uh, over these two different elections, the support towards Barisan National among the Malay Melanau voters had increased very significantly to about 8%. So basically, um, what, what you can conclude from this is um, the Bumi Putra voters, who basically form the uh, majority of the voters in the rural areas, are basically the backbone of Barisan National dominance in Sarawak. And if you look at the number of uh, seats. If you look at the rural seats in the 2013, based on 2013 election results, 94% of rural seats went to Barisan National. Where a significant, a strong majority actually of urban seats, about 65%, voted for the opposition. Now, in, in, in looking at that, that would be. Uh, a brief backdrops to, to Sarawak uh, elections uh, going into the next uh, state election, either end of the year or the first quarter of next year. So these are the, I mean, there are other electoral dynamics that would eventually uh, affect the outcome of the elections. Say, for example, voter turn out, who are the candidates, so on and so forth. Uh, but I would like to focus on these five key electoral dynamics which I believe would eventually affect the outcome of the, the uh, elections. The number one is Barisan National's solidarity. Um, with the emergence of splinter groups from within Barisan National, uh, the formation of UPP and Teras, this would basically pose a serious test to Barisan National's solidarity. The question would arise on how would Adnan accommodate this group? Would he you know, give uh, uh, seats to them in the state election, which are traditionally being held by SUPP and also SPDP? And how would SUPP and SPDP respond to uh, the inclusions, if, if Adnan decided so, the inclusions of uh, the splinter groups um, within Barisan National Sarawak? And, and mind you, some of these uh, UPP and also Teras leaders are basically incumbent assemblymen. So if, if, let's say, they decided to contest whether as Barisan National official candidate or otherwise, uh, this would seriously pose a uh, problem to Barisan National. It could basically split uh, Barisan National votes there. So this, this would uh, basically um, play a very important role in making sure that Barisan National uh, winning big in the next elections, whether they can can uh, come out as a solid unit uh, in the coming elections. The second uh, key electoral uh, dynamics would be the schisms within the opposition. 
um, if if you notice in the last two elections where opposition managed to make a significant inroad in Sarawak, they were able to form a united front. Hence, they were able to ensure straight fights. And in, in the last two state elections, 2006, 2011, because of that, um, the opposition, especially, especially DAP, were able to gain uh, a significant number of seats. In 2011, that was the biggest haul by the opposition since 1987, the famous Ming Court affair. Uh, but with the breakup of Pakatan Rakyat, with DAP publicly announced that they're going to contest 35 or so seats, and most of these seats are the seats that PKR would also contest, and most of these seats are also marginal seats, uh, where the opposition actually has a, a fighting chance of, of winning these seats. So this is where these multi-corner fights would eventually affect the chances of the opposition to win more seats in the next election. And uh, the third uh, key electrodynamics would be Adnan's factor. I think after 34 years, uh, this is the first time Sarawak going into the election with the new Commander-in-Chief, uh, with the retirement of the you know, infamous Taib Mahmoud. Uh, I, I'm sure uh, Adnan's um, reign will bring the feel-good factor among Sarawak electorates, akin to what Pak Lah brought to Malaysia in 2004. And, and not only that, um, uh, Adnan, over the last year or so, had been splashing a flurry of populist policies and measures as well. Uh, some of them, for example, um, uh, recently he even announced uh, the plan to review the constructions of some mega dams. And they actually, uh, Adnan, uh, I, was, I was informed a few weeks ago, um, he, he even invited some safe rivers uh, leaders as well who were fighting uh, against uh, Baram Dam to his house. And they had uh, a very meaningful dialogue. Uh, you know? So, so he's, he's um, putting up this He's, he's engaging his critics as well, so that, that is uh, a fresh approach from the previous uh, chief ministers as well. And, and he also basically hijacked the opposition agenda of Sarawak autonomy. And instead of denying it, he's basically embracing it. And I think he's taking advantage of the spread of Sarawak nationalism among uh, you know, a rising number of Sarawakians as well. Uh, for the first time this year, Sarawak is celebrating uh, the much debated Independence Day on the, on the 22nd July. They had a formal uh, uh, ceremony in the Dun uh, building uh, this year. So this would be the first time in the history of Sarawak celebrating the Independence Day. And, and, and I think Adnan is very smart in, in, in basically saying yet yeah, no to um, no, the interference of federal power, Barisan National Pusat, and also saying no to the opposition parties, which are basically uh, peninsula-based as well, PKR, DAP, and also PAS. Yeah, so that, to me, that is a very strategic move on the part of the chief minister. So, so he came up with some populist measures as well, which I think were able to win back some of the lost, lost votes in 2011. Issues, uh, I think this is where it will be interesting to, to talk about uh, the impact of corruption issues um, uh, in, in the next election. I think in the last uh, two elections, uh, the issue of corruption, especially against the chief ministers, uh, were widely used by the opposition, especially DAP in the urban areas. And I think it, is, it was in the last two elections and urban issues. Uh, which affected uh, a lot of the urban voters, not so much of the rural voters. And, and to me, this is where, although you might be talking about how important uh, the issues of corruption to Malaysians, to, uh, uh, to the urban Malaysians generally, but I think in, gen in the case of Sarawak, especially among rural voters, this is where corruption could take second or third 
uh, uh, forth in terms of the importance to, to, to the voters. I think what is uh, interesting uh, in the coming election would be the issue of Sarawak nationalism, which had been gaining uh, popularity in the last one year or so. Um, and interestingly, uh, the issue of Sarawak nationalism autonomy had been played out by the opposition. Um, and this is not new, actually. Um, in the past, the opposition had uh, packaged it in a different way. They might be talking about the increase of oil royalty, for example. Uh, or in the past, they might be talking about 20 points. Uh, but uh, lately, it had been taking uh, quite a different uh, uh, turn, uh, taking up Sarawak nationalism as, as, as a theme. Uh, so you, you have slogans like Sarawak for Sarawakians. Um, and if you in Kuching or around the big cities in Sarawak, you can see a lot of bumper stickers, eh? Sarawak for Sarawakians. And I think in the last one or two months, there are stickers demanding for referendum, in fact, which is pushing the boundaries as well. So I think this, uh, and, and in the past, it would benefit the opposition uh, in a peculiar way, but I think in this coming election, uh, it will benefit Barisan National Sarawak Adnan Sati more than the opposition, in fact. Uh, so, yeah, so this, this might, the, the issue in the il coming election would be how would the opposition able to challenge and contest this issue of Sarawak nationalism and address it. Another issue is uh, patronage. I think in the last one or two years, um, DAP with this Go Rural, Rural Sarawak campaign and also PKR also uh, coming up with uh, minor rural projects campaign uh, had been trying to challenge um, this Barisan national dominance of uh, politics of development. Um, well, I'm, I'm not really sure this is something that people like me, political scientists, would, would, would keen to, to look at and observe. Uh, in places where DAP and also PKR had run this uh, rural campaign projects and how much would it affect the voters there. Interestingly, for example, NCR land had been a staple issue in our election for many, many years. And in the last Balingian by election, when was it? Last year, last two years, uh, there was one kampung in Balingian where PKR represented the kampung and they won actually. And in the Balingan by-election, the whole kampung actually voted for Barisan National. So, you know, voting is one thing, um, issues that are important to voters, another. So we, we're not really sure how much issues that are important to voters would actually translate into votes as well. So that would be interesting. But to me, it's very significant, this Go Rural campaign, because I think it's uh, a start for opposition parties to go rural and make the presence felt because this is one of the weaknesses of the opposition in Sarawak that they don't have grassroots presence especially in rural areas and of course uh, the last electoral dynamics would be electoral fraud um, uh, in, in especially in marginal seats um, how much vote buying would, would eventually affect uh, the outcome of the elections. Shifting of voters, there are reports of shifting of voters, especially uh, in the process of redelineation uh, you know, that is taking place now. So this would also affect uh, the final outcome of the elections as well. So having said that, after looking at this key electoral dominant, uh, electoral dynamics, is change of government possible in, in the coming uh, state elections? Um, if you look at, this is based on 2013 uh, election results. Um, if let's say there is a 10% swing to the opposition based on the results in 2013, on top of the 13 seats that they won in 2013, they would have an additional 16 seats that would bring about 29 seats and that would be enough to deny Barisan National two-third majority in Dun. Uh, and if there is a 15% swing to the opposition, 
that will give them an additional 22 seats and that would amount to 35 seats, still not enough to actually form a simple majority government. And this is basically a mathematical calculation. Uh, in reality, it would be difficult and to a certain extent quite impossible to change government in the next election. Um, based on, move on to the next slide. Now, let's, let's look at the history of elections in Sarawak and, and uh, uh, the amount of change that had happened from 1970 up to 2011. Uh, uh, election and this is Barisan National's popular vote. The biggest decline of vote that Barisan National had experienced was in 1987. This was during the big Ming Court affair, and this is not because of the appeal of the opposition. This was because of the split within Barisan National itself, and most of the um, opposition candidates who contested as opposition were basically former Sarawak ministers, Sarawak assemblymen, so on and so forth. So the biggest decline of votes in the history of elections in Sarawak was minus 13. So to, to achieve minus 15 uh, would be a big feat on, on the part of uh, the opposition. So what would be the possible scenarios? Um, now, the opposition might, might they, they currently they have 15 seats in, 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 uh, in the state assembly based on the 2011 election results. Um, you know, based on the key electoral dynamics that I discussed recently with the split within the opposition, uh, with Adnan's factor coming into the picture, so on and so forth, uh, the minimum number of seats that the opposition can gain in the uh, coming elections is about six seats. Uh, I would argue it that way because six seats, these seats are the one where opposition have about 70, more than 70% popular votes. And for them to lose this seat, they basically have to lose about more than 20% votes in the six seats. So they have a very significant, a very strong majority votes here in the six seats, and all basically Chinese majority seats, mostly the APs. And the maximum gain, which I would foresee very difficult to achieve, would be between 13 to 17 seats. And some of these additional seats are Chinese majority seats. In 2013, there were a lot more Chinese majority seats became marginal. So the contest between Barisan National, SUPP, and DAP were much closer in 2013 compared to 2011. So, but if you know, the opposition can ensure straight fights, they were split in Barisan National, and these other key electoral dynamics come into play, they might gain more seats. If not, you know, they would be getting about six to maybe additional one or two seats. Um, basically, that's, that's my presentation for today. I didn't talk much about the, the survey because honestly, I was not involved in the survey. I was Vidan uh, Terjun today. Um, so on, upon the request of Ben, so here I am. But if, if, if you have any questions in relation to Sarawak elections and, and issues of corruptions later on, I would be more than happy to entertain. Thank you very much.